It's, uh, it's an honor to welcome you to this, uh, the uh, Miami Corona Project Conversations, Mayor Phillips. Uh, so happy to have you here uh, as the mayor of South Miami, uh, talking to us a little bit today about um, this incredible crisis. I couldn't help but uh, reading through um, the, uh, the personal statement that you emailed me uh, comparing uh, this uh, pandemic to the way that um, um, we have um, interacted with our planet. And I just wanted to take a minute to first of all ask you how, how you have personally uh, been impacted by this pandemic and how it is that you feel uh, about what is going on. Well, personally, I, I'm not so sure I've been heavily impacted um, because I was pretty much living alone and minding my own business and not um, out and about as much. I, I haven't isolated myself as hard as some people. I go shopping with my mask and I visit with my significant other on a regular basis. And I go into City Hall wearing my mask when I want to. So it um, really hasn't changed a lot for me. Um, I also, it, it sort of started at the same time as I started as, as mayor. So the difficulties or newnesses that I have, it's sometimes hard to know whether it's being a mayor or being, you know, having this pandemic around me. Yeah, you've been you've been involved in city governance uh, for for a very long time, chairing committees and uh, being involved in all sorts of civic uh, duties. Um, and um, you know your background, obviously, uh, as a as a psychologist, as a doctorate, uh, you know, um, and someone who tries to problem solve, uh, especially working with EAP. Uh, you 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 understand how. Um, how interconnected we are and how, how vulnerable we are as individuals, humans, just, this gets as a matter fact, That's sort of the way I see it being a mayor is that I get individual requests or individual comments and it's sort of my duty to find out what's the best way of resolving whatever has been brought to me, very much like an EAP. Yeah. So it, it, you're, you're probably the, um, if I'm trying to think of Miami-Dade County governance, you're probably the the, the youngest of all elected officials, right? If it started in February uh, and you had no, I don't think you had prior elective office. So this is baptism by fire. <laughs> so uh, how is, um, you know, South Miami, uh, I mean, I can, I know South Miami really well. You can talk about it more eloquently than I can. Uh, it's a, in fact, uh, describe South Miami and its context within Miami-Dade County for, for those who may not know um, uh, what the municipality is. What was the question? Yeah, uh, describe South Miami, you know, it's how many well, inhabitants, where it's located. Just uh, Well, it's, sort of, it's at a crossroads of a couple of big uh, 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 um, highways. There's it's Dixie uh, Highway divides us, adds us Sunset Drive, and the two of them make us a crossroads in that it, there's a lot of traffic coming and going morning and evening. Uh, we're also one of the only uh, cities that has a metro rail station right in the middle of us. So we, we are positioned to move toward less traffic uh, of our own if we can do more uh, of encouraging of people using the metro rail, yeah. which is not a simple thing. So it's a it's a it's a relatively small um, uh, community. How many uh, residents are there in about South Miami? Twelve to thirteen thousand, right. and about and it's about a, two square miles, except that those miles are kind of chopped up, and, and there's one area where there's you know, almost individual houses are part of the city, and their neighbors are part of unincorporated Dade County, uh, and a friend of mine refers to that as the South Miami Keys because we, they're all. Um, it's not easy to think of them as united with us, but yeah. they are. In every way, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a municipality nestled, you know, between um, other areas, West Miami at the north, uh, Pinecrest at the uh, Coral Gables at the east, Pinecrest at the south. You abut Pinecrest, don't you? Uh, it's to the, Pinecrest is to the south, Coral Gables to the north. Um, to the west is unincorporated for the most part, um, and to the east is still Coral Gables. 
yeah. So it's so you know it's it's a it's a, a, across the street from the University of Miami, literally on the other side of Red Road. And I know you uh, were one of us uh, Canes for the longest time. So thank you for your service to to our university. Um, so I'm just trying to paint a picture of 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 um, of what you lead as a new mayor, uh, and. And that, um, and I hadn't really thought about it. I knew that there were these individual pockets. Uh, I didn't realize like they were as discreet as individual houses of, um, of, of residents that comprise your city. But in many ways, when I think of South Miami, I literally at the crossroads of all of this happening, in, in every way we, we can understand how this is a problem um, that isn't just uh, uh, within an enclosed municipality, this pandemic, impacts all of us, but also uh, needs to be managed in a broader way. And I'm just wondering how that relationship has been with you as a mayor, uh, with other mayors, uh, with the county officials, with the state officials in, in addressing this pandemic. Um, you know, there are curfews that are imposed. You have your own police department. Uh, um, what, what, tell me what it is like to govern in the age of Corona when and, and, and also about how the information to what, to what do I compare it and, and to what and what models have I got? Um, I, I, what I have really been impressed about with our city is how well run it is and how well uh, it has responded to what can be done. What is most disheartening is what happens to our small retailers because South Miami, loves its downtown, but the downtown is dying. And it was not doing well before the pandemic and is doing terribly now. And long range, that's probably pressing on me is trying to figure how is it going to work out and how can we stimulate it if and when there's a, a, a way to stimulate it. Right it's, now. it's a charming downtown and I, I love and know all those restaurants all my life when I was living on campus and now that I live just a few miles just south of that downtown it is my a downtown in many ways yeah, a lot and of it, people come yeah it's and and of course what's impacted most are the restaurants right the indoor exactly. restaurants and that's the heart of that downtown so uh you're right there is uh going to be uh a lot of suffering that isn't going to end immediately, I don't think, because once those restaurants close down, uh, it's kind of hard to build it up. Have you had some feedback from your restaurant owners? I know that there's a huge issue now because the county closed uh, with reason. Well, they um, closed re restaurants to interior seating. They are allowing exterior seating, and we've done what we can to encourage exterior you know, on the sidewalk seating, including you know, no more fees for having outdoor dining, and, and spreading out you know, in front of other businesses, not just maintaining in front of your own, so that we are encouraging uh, restaurants to spread out. Um, there isn't a whole lot we can do. The county, you asked about what some of the difficulties are, yes. right? Now, the county has gotten a bunch of money from the federal government, but they're doodling around about sharing that with the cities. And there's a real conflict or there's a real unhappiness about the fact that we've spent money and will be spending money and the county is holding it and not divvying it up and there's big discussion about how are they going to, to divvy it up yeah i understand that so the, the county obviously is a regional government and they've um they've spent a lot of their resources there's also a lot of um funding of organizations and nonprofits that they do that provide uh, countywide services, which is another way of providing services to cities as well as the areas west of your uh, municipality. So it is, it is this issue of governance. And what I was asking you about as a, as a, as a new mayor, what I was getting at is that my sense is I could be wrong, uh, but that you don't, you're not entrenched in any of these politics. You're really a, a new public elected official that doesn't yeah, I don't know it. who's who or what's what. That is true. I'm <laughs> gradually learning who's what person belongs to which category of, of relationship. And, and I'm sure that's a very complex web because it's not it's not binary. There's there's you know all sorts of intricate relationships. In okay. fact, that's I think I mean we can have our, our our political discussion later. But I think that's one of the things that makes Miami 
uh, healthier, right? That there isn't just one power structure. It's, it's, it's diluted. It's not that business runs our community or a, a, a particular political uh, party or political kingmaker. Uh, 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 it, it is a diffuse form of governance, which is good. But in situations like this, uh, especially when, uh, and I've heard this from other elected officials I've interviewed, uh, there's a lack of, of communication that's consistent. And that's one problem when you're trying to uh, figure out how to allocate resources within the sausage making process of governance and allocation. It's another when you're trying to convey a message to the community that's unified so they know whether or not it's okay to wear masks or whether it's okay to stay home or how seriously to take it. And when you compound that with what's happening in Tallahassee and especially uh, at the White House uh, where two horrible uh, pieces of information came uh, to me uh, late last night. One, one is um, that the uh, CDC is now pushing back on the administration uh, for the first time when it comes to the issue of schools and not wanting to relent yet again on uh, public health mandates on opening schools. So that, that the fact that we're even having uh, public health experts uh, being accused of being part of the deep state that's getting in the way of a political process for a November election during a pandemic when so many tens of thousands, soon to be hundreds of thousands of Americans are gonna die is uh, unbelievable, unimaginable. And the second thing I heard this morning that is, uh, pings me uh, is that we've heard of um, uh, clearly how different states, Arizona uh, was among the highest of positivity rates, the percentage of people who get tested, who indeed test positive uh, for uh, the coronavirus. Well, this morning's, uh, this morning's uh, news tells us that a third of our testing in Miami-Dade County, one out of every three people being tested turned to be positive for this virus, which is an astronomical rate. Uh, we thought that 25% in Arizona was impossible. We're now at 33%. And, 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 and for a community like ours, uh, that, that, that does not bode well. So you as a mayor, as you know, you have a hospital with some intensive care units right there. I think you may have more than one. I know for sure you have South Miami. I'm not sure if there's others. And working, yeah. uh, in your community, you have, um, you know, um, what inevitably are going to be uh, uh, more curfews. And you are also, I think, uh, going to have these restaurant owners who are going to um, be losing um, everything, basically everything. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just wondering, again, there's various levels of governance, but you as, as a mayor, how do you, how do you uh, navigate through that and be uh, it, internally within your own structure? And I know it's limited government. I mean, there's, it's not, you're, you don't do regional governments uh, and you don't have your own public health department, but how do you as a mayor uh, confront this? How do you work with your fellow elected officials in a very small uh, municipality to tackle these, these big, big issues? Well, we try to make sure that whatever comes down from the, the county in terms of curfews and in terms of rules that we follow them and our code enforcement and our police have been very good about going about and not being nasty about it, but reminding people and, and encouraging people to follow the rules. Now, I, indeed, last night I was at a restaurant where, an outdoor restaurant where we were, where people were sitting, and there was a table where there were six people, and I went inside and I said, listen, the, the rules are there's only supposed to be four, you know, be careful because I don't want you to be tagged, because at, in South Miami, we set it up that if it, twice a restaurant was caught, you know, not abiding by the rules, that they would be closed for four days. And we, and we have recently passed a, a, a ordinance that if a person is warned twice, the second time that person faces a $50 fine if he or she is not wearing a mask in public where it's impossible to stay six feet distance. So um, we're trying because 
we take it seriously. And I went upstate recently on a visit to a family, to my family, and we were shocked at how many people were not wearing masks. You know, in, in the stores that we went into, people were blatant. And it, 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 it was, <laughs> we felt out of place with our masks. It was strange. Um, but Miami has been, South Miami has been very good. And one of the ways in which I feel good about South Miami is that we tested everybody who has been coming into work in uh, City Hall. And in the city hall itself, none of the people, and that's about 112 people, were positive. There have been a couple of positives in, in the police department, but that kind of is expected when they're out and about as much as they are. And we've had to set, shut down a couple of our um, buildings or, or areas and tell everybody, go home for two weeks, which we do, and expect them to be online and on phone and do what they can from home. And, you know, I am so impressed with the city's staff and how well we have continued to operate smoothly with all of our services still in place. That, that teamwork has been amazing. The, um, the community also has some wonderful schools, including the Cobras, I think, the South Miami uh, Cobras. Is it the Cobras? It better be. Otherwise, my, my memory is failing me. I'm pretty sure it's the Cobras up on, on Ludlam um, and Miller. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if you, again, there's a school board that manages schools. There's a superintendent that addresses that. But again, as the mayor, uh, where there's lots of parents and students, have you had any... Um, uh, information or any any uh, feedback from parents about school opening versus not opening? Not yeah. yet. Not yet. So that, that, that again is another uh, issue that of course will uh, uh, land <laughs> land uh, at your... We don't have a whole lot to say and I think the school that I'm most aware of is the elementary school on Ludlam and right. that, that's really in the city. The other, uh, the middle school is in the city but the high school is not. Oh, it's just one block away. Okay. It's just, it's just one block west. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Thought it was one of your keys. Right. It's named South Miami High. I don't know. <laughs> it's south of Miami. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, no, just wondering how, and, and, and I know that, uh, that elementary school as well. I'm just wondering if there were any, any issues that, that were coming from there. With, with, with respect to the restaurant owners, and I think this is important, part of what this conversation is about, it's, it's, it's twofold, right? It's, it's to, to uh, have an understanding of what's happening now. Um, you know, your, your residents who are listening to this uh, hopefully will understand the complexity of the issues that you're dealing with. Um, your your um, resolve to making sure that people wear masks, that they follow the rules, that you will uh, enforce them. So that's, it's partially to, to um, educate people. At the end of the conversation, I'm gonna ask you to please uh, give a, a hopeful message to your residents as, as the leader. That's how we're gonna close, so we're gonna end on a good note. But I'm also doing this as an archive. You know, how our leaders, the ones who had their hand at the wheel, work through this pandemic so that we understand, you know, what we did, you know, how, up, how we prepared, but also how unprepared we were. So part of what I'm doing is trying to, to get a sense of this, and, and here's a, a conversation I want to have with you, just going back to your restaurant donors, because in, in so many ways, a, such a small municipality, I'm assuming, a, you know, obviously your tax base comes from your, your property values in your home, but that core in downtown. Most, most of you, I mean, a higher percentage comes from what was downtown. Yeah. I mean, what was, <laughs> because it, it isn't anymore really to talk about, but about 61% of our taxes very good. Coming from downtown. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that high, but in yeah. other words, sixty-one percent of your of your tax yeah, base yeah, is, tax is that down is that downtown, and and um, and I care passionately about <clears throat> not just the owner of the restaurant, but the busboy and the waitress and the client. So there's no, uh, and these are people who don't have the luxury of doing uh, what I'm doing, which is, you know, sitting in my home office and having a conversation, they must go to work. So um, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is this, is that uh, there's this tension between trying to solve an economic problem and uh, the necessity of saving lives. 
And I'm, I'm just wondering if the owners of those restaurants who need, you know, whose entire life, like everything they own, you know, what they're going to give their children's inheritance, right? When they see that crumbling apart, right, their personal ability to do that and to create jobs for other people, when you see that crumbling apart, is there a sense, um, and I'm being very general here, but is there a sense in what you've seen in the, in, in the, uh, business owners who have approached you that they have this duty to think beyond themselves and to understand that if I have to lose my restaurant, that is just another consequence of the pandemic? Or are we still at the point where we're still trying to, to protect and hold on to the, the things that we do own before we lose them? In other words, have we crossed over into, into the empathy arena? Or during this pandemic at this moment when the worst is yet to come? Are we still holding on? Uh, and I love the analogies you 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 make because you you made them really well uh, with uh, the environment and the pandemic. But we're in a boat and the boat is sinking, and you know there are some people who are still trying to hold on to their goods uh, to see if they can make it to the shore, but they may not make it to the shore, uh, and people are literally dying. So, are they ready to dump off their goods? Uh, or not like where are we i think there are those that are but i in truth i have not had that level of conversation with any of the owners i know some of them are really angry because they don't they are what seems to be most lacking for me is a way to communicate with everybody in a in a, in a uniform way um there i ha i personally do not have a list of all the emails of every of all of the the um businesses so i can't send them um i i have been one of the things that i have done as a result of this is to write um oh sometimes it's daily sometimes it's every three days newsletter of my own and send it to a list that i have but it's a very small list it's not even i don't even think it's two thousand names so that when you have twelve thousand i'm not reaching very many but i try to tell people what is the most recent coming uh, order coming from the governor or, or from the mayor of Miami-Dade or what is our most, the South Miami's most recent orders or, or regulations. And so some, and I also try to remind people that food is available. I do think that the food that is being offered through the county and through all kinds of other organizations has been probably very savings because not only are the restaurant owners are losing everything, there are people who've been laid off jobs, you know, and, and the, 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 the state has been a mess about re, re, uh, processing their, their unemployment. So that losing everything is, is pandemic. It is not limited to any one or a group of people. And it, it, it's beyond certainly South Miami making much of a difference for its residents in, in those in that aspect. It's where we really need to look to the federal government to run welfare. Yeah. I mean, this is what welfare was put in place for, for people who got stuck and, and, and needed a, a bridge. And um, it's gonna, it's, I think it's gonna need to come to that for a lot of people. And yes, getting back to restaurants, there have been a couple that have closed, some of them that were ready to close anyway, and some that yeah, yeah. have had to close just because. Yeah, yeah I, bring, I bring the restaurant issue only because it's become a controversial issue, a controversial okay. issue because the county closed them and then, in my opinion, prematurely opened them and now is closing them again. Well, and the lack of communication um, has led to an incredible amount of frustration. Uh, and that's just part of the unpreparedness that I uh, wanted to uh, bring out in this conversation as we, again, enter this pandemic without a playbook. The second thing I, I, I found just in my conversations with elected officials is that there is uh, conflicting communications. Again, everyone is doing this by the seat of their parents, and some of them are doing it responding to partisan issues. And that, again, is problematic. I think that um, um, speaking with one voice, with resolve, um, with a clear understanding, we, we, I'm assuming, and that's the lesson I'm trying to figure out, if it's a lesson to be learned, we are better at this pandemic. And I, I was very proud of where we were at the beginning. I was 
uh, very proud of our numbers. We all sheltered in place, but somehow, um, whether it's because of leadership or just a human condition that people just didn't want to sacrifice, or they said, well, there's nothing wrong, so let's go ahead and yeah. it's hard. reconnect, it's hard. not realizing that the reason there was nothing wrong is because they were social distancing, right? So, so uh, where, what I'm trying to do through this process is, is identify some of those things. Are there some, are there some lessons that um, you know you have learned, or that you um, you think are important as we prepare for future pandemics? And the reason I ask is, is because your writing, which we will be posting along with your bio in the website where this um, where this uh, video is going to be placed in within our website. Uh, in it, you talk about the connection between the environment, uh, pollution, and pandemics, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the very fact that we pollute, put carbon up in the atmosphere, uh, these greenhouse gases trap heat, they completely change ecosystems, and they make the tropics move north towards the subtropics, that's us, bringing with them the vectors of disease. So at one very, very clear level, it makes it, e pollution makes it easier for pandemics to come to South Miami. Secondly, deforestation, which again leads, it's a lot, you know, deforestation is how you destroy the environment because you destroy whole ecosystems and you kill the lungs of this planet. You kill the thing that produces oxygen and takes those greenhouses out of the atmosphere. When you get rid of that, you allow for further polluting, but you also, uh, destroy habitats. You go into places where there are wild animals and now those wild animals are in contact with humans or other animals that are in contact with humans in ways that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So yes, what you noted, this uh, climate emergency that we are enduring and this planet and will particularly, uh, as you noted at the beginning of your essay, the idea of sea level rise, that we will um, as a community have to deal with that so we can't keep our eye off that. And that's but, what but, the pandemic has done is that I really came into the job hoping to do something about our septic systems in South Miami. Absolutely. And it's, My it's, God. That is incredibly... talking about that now, but if we don't do something about it, it's all going to be a stinking mess. And, and a contaminating uh, mess, right? Stinking oh. and... Right, of course. I mean, that's the problem we're having with some of the sewage on our bay. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, to your point, right, the idea as our water table rises, as sea level rises, as our, as our septic tanks, those not connected to sewers, as our septic tanks aren't able um, to be usable when you, you know, your, your property value goes to zero because you can't have a house that can't... Unless you have a sewer system, and, there's, and that depends on the county, and the county has to have the, the money and, the, and the, the facilities to manage it all. So it, it, the, the, the pandemic has, has diverted from that, which I think is very, very important, but not real visible. And in the same way, this, 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 this pandemic is very important, but not visible. And that's why people have said, hey, ah, you know, I, I've been home long enough, let me go out. And, and then they get very, you know, and the communication, not only from me to my residents or my business people, but the communication at the um, county level between the city mayors has been not very good. And the county mayor has sometimes said things that make it more difficult to backtrack or to revise. And so this whole thing about what happened with restaurants, first they, you know, absolutely all closed and then, oh no, no, okay, we'll allow people to be on the sidewalks. Well, that just has made it crazy for folks. It's within, you know, a, a half night that things change, you know, from <laughs> seven o'clock, you know, seven o'clock one evening to the next morning, they have changed. Yep. And there's no way to communicate that. You know, I think if anything, we, we, we need to learn, we need to build good solid communication systems, um, you know, and that's something I have <laughs> said from the time I came in. I don't think that our particular city website is user friendly. And so if people were going to go to it for, for information, they'd have a hard time finding out what was the most current. Even if it were posted, they would have a hard time finding it. And, and it, it, that, that's very irritating to me. Yeah. No, you, 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 um, 
you know, uh, teased out some, some important lessons about communication, about speaking with clarity, about being better prepared, about the invisible, about our uh, lack of uh, willpower to stay it, to see it through. Um, and, and of course, what the lesson is that <clears throat> you let down your guard or you get tired of it, it doesn't go away. Just because you stop worrying about sea level rise doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. Just because yeah. you stop wor wearing masks doesn't mean that everything's okay. In fact, the virus is still as um, adamant and so are our rising seas. So I think those are, those are really strong and important connections. And also yourself as a landlocked, I think you're landlocked, yeah, as a landlocked mayor, um, you care passionately about sea level rise because you have all those canals coming across it. You are low elevations and your septic tanks aren't going to yeah. work. So you need a sewer system and you need a plan. And even if it didn't impact your, your city, if all the other well, you know, even if our planet has high spots, but what good are those high spots if they're surrounded by water? And how are you going to get to, where, where are you going to go buy groceries? If you, do you get into a boat? I mean, and people aren't, aren't beginning to think like that yet. It's too scary. I mean, it would mean that our barrier islands, which are their most expensive places, are no longer livable. Or they have to revise how they live dramatically yeah these are the big challenges that, that we face and this pandemic uh yes, while it clearly in so many ways slams a door and and that's so unfortunate slams a door in thinking about the future what i'm trying to do to these conversations is understand that it's the exact opposite that what we're seeing here is ways to understand how vulnerable and unprepared we are for future pandemics and future crises that, that, uh, well, that... you know, the way we're treating the pandemic is the way we're probably going to treat sea level rise. Not until it actually is, is anything going to happen. And then it's going to be, oh dear, why didn't we do something different? Yeah. And we can look now at, at the pandemic and say, oh dear, why didn't they do something different in February and, and stick to their guns? But <laughs> You have a, a wonderful resident in Holly Sickler who uh, is a member of my Underwater Homeowners Association. And I know that there are neighbors uh, in your community, um, including uh, your predecessor, who work really, really hard at trying to address the issue and crisis of our time. So um, I'm not going to give the message of hope because you are, but let me just tell you that I personally um, have a sense of of hope with uh, your beloved city because I know that it is a tight-knit community. I know that the neighbors care and love one another. I know that just as in hurricanes, uh, when bad things happen, they come together and they pull together. I, I, I know that the darkest moments coming in front of us uh, where that safety net that you asked for won't be there, that in a, in a way that isn't sufficient, then we can't just delegate it to neighbors. Government needs to step in. But that, that in the interim, until we be develop a better plan. I know your neighbors and I know that they will come together and help one another because that's what South Miami has okay, done. For sure. but, yeah. It's not enough. It's not enough because no one's going to buy some guy a restaurant or help pay your mortgage. I get it. Uh, <laughs> it's not enough. It, yeah. it's, been, it, it's been such a pleasure. Yeah. Um, it's been such a pleasure meeting you uh, online and, um, and speaking um, and speaking with you. And I just wanted to see if there were some, just some last words you wanted to, to share with us, including a, a message directly to your residents through these dark times that undoubtedly are coming because the rates keep escalating and the positivity uh, also keeps growing. Yeah, well, I don't know that I have a whole lot of hope. I, huh. <laughs> I tend to be kind of almost pessimistic because I don't see that people have the willpower, but I, I do wish that people would take seriously that this pandemic is not going to disappear, that they need to be safe for themselves. But even in the process of being safe for yourself, you're being safe for others. And if you don't really care much about yourself, I hope you care enough about others to wear a, mat, a, a mask. Because it's the only thing, and it's a really rather small thing, that we've been able to find that stops. And until, and there will probably be a vaccine long before there is a um, sewer system, but I will hope and look forward to that vaccine coming to all of us being ready to be 
inoculated and to get on with trying to pull it all back together. And I, there's, we've got the re resources to pull it together. We just need to get ourselves healthy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's been a true honor uh, speaking with you. Thank stay you. safe and stay healthy. You too. Take care. Bye. Take care.